bringing it back to Gamergate. Um, some critics have argued that Gamergate was mostly or entirely right wing. Now, <coughs> you've been very open about your conservative views, and I think that's fine. I think that there's a place in Gamergate. There was a place for Gamergate for conservatives and liberals to work together um, and have a nonpartisan movement about gaming and making gaming better. I think that's a good thing. But yeah. what do you think of this characterization? Was were most of the people you worked with in Gamergate right wing? No. In fact, I would say that the characterization is wrong. Pretty much almost everyone I met was left on either center left or, or, or even progressive left. I had never met I mean, in my life. I've met more trans people than I had ever in my entire life because of Gamergate. Um, in fact, like I would say I would character, I would characterize myself as one of the more right wing people, but the majority of people, if not like 90% of the people I ever met were left wing. Yeah. Gamergate made me pro trans people. And Oh, another thing also, and just so, just to make sure you put it here and it might be someone you might consider for a future, um, uh, what do you call it? Interview. Have you considered talking to Brad Glasgow? I've actually reached out to him. We've been in talks. Okay, good. Because Brad was the one who actually did that study of where do people lie in the political spectrum in terms of in terms of. Well, there were multiple in. studies, but his methodology was very good. I, I think he did a good job. Yeah, he is the one who actually determined where the political spectrum of Gamergate was, and I think that actually is a really good, um, really good lead-in for that because Brad was was the one who did it. Yeah, he also said he was going to write a book. I don't think that ever happened. Like, not to put the guy on blast or anything, but, like, he did say that, did he not? Yeah, I, I think he did, but I, I didn't follow up, and I kind of, I was kind of off Twitter for a while to actually follow up and ask him, and I, you know, maybe you should ask him if you get a chance, and you know, for me and for everyone else. Hey, have you ever considered writing that book? And I don't know if anyone, would, you know, how much people would buy out of it, but, you know, he's got his own life, so. <laughs> Do you want to talk about your political views or philosophy? Well, anyway, I don't know if you have any questions for me on it, but like they're, per they're pertinent, but go ahead. Um, have your views changed since Gamergate or because of Gamergate? Well, I mean, I came into this as a, as a, you know, a Catholic, a very strongly believing Catholic. And I left, I left even more so. I don't think it, I mean, if you call that a political view, because the you know, Catholic Church tend to straddle different, different types of things in terms of their viewpoints. It hasn't changed in a sense, other than the fact they gave me more experience with more, more types of people. The internet tends to do that. <laughs> so. And I got to talk to all sorts of people and, and you know, all walks of life, and it really, in many ways, enriched me to learn from so many people, even people who were trolls. <laughs> you know, I learned a lot from a lot of people. So, I mean, did it change anything other than the fact that I think the best thing it does is that it humanizes people. You get to talk to people who don't who don't agree with you, and in, in many ways, put a person behind it. How many of those people turned out to be real? I don't know. I mean, there there might have been people who were fake or or you know, bot accounts or even like you know what they called uh, sock puppet accounts. <laughs> but I don't I know for the people who I did talk to, there were a lot of really good people I met, and I got to learn a lot from them. Some people say that Gamergate was the first battle of the culture war. Do you have any thoughts on this framing? I think that actually the culture war goes much much older. Um, I think we talked about it briefly, but I think I think the culture war goes goes way way back. I mean, at least six hundred years in my in my estimation. I the way I'd frame it is this: is that the the idea is that if you take the core stories of a civilization, right? What makes up a civilization are its core mythologies and and stories, and you know, there's the myth of America and what people believe it, and there's a the myth of the Western civilization. People make it the myth of the Roman Empire. So now we've zero days since we talked about the Roman Empire. <laughs> uh, but you know, like there's an, there's an idea of what civilization is built upon upon a series of stories. And around 500 years ago, there there was a major dispute over how you tell that story, especially one of the key stories of Western civilization being the Bible. And one people said, well, we have the authority. And the other people said, well, no, the, the individual has the authority to tell that story. And it goes back to stories, doesn't it? And so the problem is, is like, okay, does the individual have the authority or does the person who is designated as the author or not the author, as the, as the custodian, have the authority to tell the story? 
And that was one of the first fractures in the culture war is that who has the right to tell the story of our civilization? Is it the audience and the people and the individual or is it the custodian? And between that, from there, it's a, the, the next question that comes out of there, that's, that's, a, that's a reformation if you can't tell what I'm talking about. The next question after there is like, well, how about we all decide to hold the values of the story, like human rights and digital freedoms, but let's get rid of the story. We don't really need the story. We just need the, 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 the values that it imposes on society. And that's the enlightenment. And that's basically the framing of most of our discussion is like, you know, do we need the stories? Are the stories important? Are the, are the stories free for the individual to make up whatever they want? Is there a canon that you understand of the story? Is there a way of understanding the story that's within the, the, the canon and spirit of the story itself? All that goes back at least 600 years. And really, I think that's, that's what we're facing in pop culture, and it goes up and down the entire chain for, the, for, for pretty much most of modern Western civilization history. And that's how I, that's how I frame it, and that's how I look at it. You know, we could probably go into this for like five hours and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Discuss probably whether or not on. the Enlightenment requires a Christian or religious foundation. And I think I'd probably disagree with you. And it would be a very fun conversation, but we could set that one oh, up maybe a different time if you want. I, okay, I would love to do that as a separate discussion. I think it'd be framed more like the Enlightenment was more of a a point where it says we don't need the Christian for we don't need the Christian story or foundation to have these values. That's what the argument of the Enlightenment is. It's like, hey, do we even need Christian values to hold the values of equality, fraternity, and you know, and and you know, do we need that? And that's the question that that people have been asking for the last three or four hundred years. And um, that's a that's a debate in the zone. But that's how I'd frame it: is that the Enlightenment was a step away from from the from the from the Christian story because the Christians were so busy killing each other over who had the right to tell the story, which was the Thirty Years' War and other, other terrible things that happened in that time. And so the Enlightenment was a step away saying, hey, let's do that. And really, you know, when it comes to the left and right, the left and right really is an argument between the left is, the left is, tends to be the Enlightenment, the right tends to be the Protestant Reformation. And that's how like, the right tends to be the religious right, and the left tends to be the progressive liberal left. And that's how the framing of the left-right is, especially in America. So that's how I'd frame the entire thing, and that's a discussion in itself. But I'd love to do that some other time, and probably outside the scope of Gamergate. So. <laughs> yeah, what does that have to do with ethics and games journalism? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it actually, it does because of postmodern theory and the idea of who owns the IP. That has, it's not ethics and games journalism, but it has to do with the second argument of Gamergate, which is what do we do with people with IP owners, the social justice. How do you tell a story without imposing your 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 ideology, religion in it? That is that is the bigger question, which I didn't think the hashtag could take. That's a that's a bigger question outside that point in time because it's a 400, 500 year story that people still haven't figured out yet, and we're in the middle of it. <laughs>